Uh, I'm, I wish I could speak your language, but I know I can't. I <laughs> have such difficulty pronouncing even particular names or words, so it's very difficult for us uh, simple-minded Americans. But it's a joy to be with you here in this place, and we praise the Lord for His, uh, His work in your church and uh, in this network of churches that uh, are honoring to Christ and upholding the authority of the Bible and wanting to, to uh, please God in the way that they conduct uh, church and the way they live their lives. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to see brothers and sisters in Christ who are like-minded to who, uh, who we are, Jody and myself. My wife Jody is here with me as well. So is this going to be in English then without a translation? Is that right? Okay, all right. I, I thought it was going to be translated, but that makes it easier, so that's fine. <clears throat> We're going to be looking this evening at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, Ephesians 1, and uh, I decided to, to just walk through this text with you because it is so helpful in, uh, in seeing better how Paul and I think this would be true of the other New Testament writers as well. You think of John and his understanding of, uh, of who God is and of Peter. Uh, but for Paul in particular, the way he thinks, when he thinks of God, he thinks of the Trinity. There, there's just, just no question that he always is thinking in terms of Father, Son, and Spirit. And uh, this text in particular is one of the texts that just highlights so beautifully the way Paul understands who those Trinitarian persons are. And uh, so the question I have, do, you, do, the, do they all have the outline too? Oh, good. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I ask people is if they have learned to read the Bible through Trinitarian lenses, you know, so when you're reading the Bible, are you aware of what I have called, come to call Trinitarian specificity, specific references to the Father or the Son or the Spirit and what they do uh, to contribute to the one work of God. So, of course, there is never any conflict between the work of the Father, Son, and Spirit. No tension. Uh, but there is distinction uh, in things that the Father specifically does and the Son specifically does and the Spirit specifically does, which, when you put it together, constitutes the one work of God. And, uh, and it's very clear that there are things the Father does the Son doesn't do, things that the Son does that the Spirit doesn't do, and so on. And so we have this, this way in which the, the biblical authors look at, uh, at the Trinitarian persons in understanding who they are in part by the roles that they exhibit in, uh, in how they carry out the work they do. And you see this so beautifully in, in Ephesians chapter 1. So let me take just, a, did you already read this passage? No. No, no okay, let, let's read this text first, and then, uh, then I'll explain how we're gonna, going, going to go through it together. Ephesians 1, uh, verses 1 to 14. I'm reading from the New American Standard translation, uh, English translation, of course. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus... Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. <clears throat> 
In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Well, what I'd like to do in our time together is look first in verses one and two at uh, what I think of as the contours of the doctrine of the Trinity that are indicated in the, way the, in the way that Paul thinks of the relationship between the Father and the Son. It's just embedded in the way in which Paul expresses who the Father and Son are and their relationship to one another. So contours of the Trinity first, I think it's just very helpful. It gives you kind of a framework for understanding what the doctrine of the Trinity is. And then in verses three to 14, we'll, we'll walk through wh- how Paul understands the work of the Father and the Son and the Spirit because he specifies them uh, very clearly and how these contribute uh, to the one work of God in bringing salvation to lost sinners. That's us. And praise be to God for his saving grace manifest, but through the work of the Father, Son, and Spirit as he identifies that. So first of all, contours of the Trinity in verses one and two. Uh, Notice that Paul begins in verse one. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now notice he doesn't say, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of Christ. You might think that would make sense, right? I mean, after all, Christ is the one who who came to Paul on the road to Damascus and uh, revealed himself to him and called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So, So you might think he would say that he's an apostle of Christ by the will of Christ, but he doesn't say that. He says, I'm an apostle of Christ by the will of God, which of course raises the question, who is God? Is, it, is this the triune God, the one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit? It's possible, but you know, it's doubtful that that's the case. For what one thing is that um, scholars have demonstrated that the vast majority, I would say 95% of the usages of theos in the New Testament, that's the word for God, is specifically God the Father. It, it sometimes is God, the one God, the one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. For example, you believe that God is one, you do well. This is James 2.19. Uh, that's obviously the one God. Uh, so there, there are usages of theos for the one God. There are, there are about nine usages of theos uh, for Christ, for the Son. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So we have, you know, some, some instances where that is the case, but the vast majority uh, where y- y- you'll find where God is shorthand for God the Father. And, uh, and this is clear in so many passages. In any case, I think that's likely here. For example, look at uh, uh, fur- further on what he says in verse two, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, right? Verse three, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So but I think what Paul has in mind is God who is Father of a Son. Okay, so going back to verse one again, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So this in all likelihood is God the Father. So isn't it interesting that he indicates that he is an apostle of Christ, not by the will of Christ per se, although surely Christ doesn't will anything differently and in, in no way would be opposed to this. But nonetheless, where does, it, where does it originate? It originates with the Father, the Father as the initiator, the Father as the one who designs, devises, plans what will take place. I mean, we'll see that much more a bit later when we come especially to verse nine. You'll see there it's very clear the Father is the one who plans all the things that take pl- takes place. So he's, he's an apostle of Christ by the will of God. Now, one thing at the most basic level, one thing that this indicates is that when Paul thinks of the the Son, Christ, and the Father, he sees them as distinct, distinct persons, right? So sometimes when I teach on the doctrine of the Trinity, I will say this, that I, I think of the doctrine of the Trinity as a giant block doctrine, massive, weighty, granite block doctrine, glorious doctrine, that is upheld by two pillars. And both those pillars have to be in place. They have to be strong. They have to be substantive in order to hold up 
the weight of this glorious doctrine. And one of those pillars uh, might be thought of as the distinction pillar, distinction, where the Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct from each other. The Father is the Father, not the Son. The Son is the Son, not the Spirit. And, uh, and, and so indeed, with the, with the doctrine of the Trinity, this is part, part of what separates the Christian faith from other monotheistic religions, like Judaism, uh, like, uh, like Islam, where there is one God, but one person, right? But in Christianity, we hold to one God who is expressed simultaneously, eternally, through three persons. The Father is a distinct personal expression of the one God. The Son, a distinct personal expression of the one God. The Spirit, likewise, a distinct personal expression of the one God. So if you don't have the distinction of Father, Son, and Spirit, then what you call Trinitarian, Trinitarianism actually collapses into Unitarianism. If, for example, Father, Son, and Spirit are like three names that are true of me. I'm Bruce, I'm Mr. Ware, I'm Jody's husband. Those are three names that are true of me. But that's not the same as Father, Son, and Spirit. Why? Because anything you would say about Bruce, you would also say about Mr. Ware. Anything you'd say about Mr. Ware, you'd also say about Jody's husband. So what would you conclude? Oh, Bruce is Mr. Ware. Mr. Ware is Jody's husband. Is that Father, Son, and Spirit? Oh, no. There's something you say about Father you cannot say of the Son. There's something you say of Son you cannot say of the Spirit. So there is real distinction in, in those names that represent three persons who are distinct from each other. So pillar number one is the distinction pillar that has to be maintained. And that's indicated in verse one when, as he thinks of Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, distinct persons, all right? Now, when you go on to verse 2, notice, notice what he says here. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I sometimes call this the power of chi because the Greek word for and is chi. So the power of chi or the power of and or what would it be in Norwegian? Actually, don't tell me because I probably can't say it. I probably can't pronounce it correctly. But that little word and in that verse just communicates something amazing, right? Think about it. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it do? What does the word and do? Well, part, part of what it does, I'm tempted to make this a classroom instead of a preaching context, context right? Uh, part of what this does is maintain what we saw in verse one, distinction between father and son, right? Grace to you and peace from God our Father, n not who is the Lord Jesus Christ. No, no, no. It's, not, it's not another name for the same person. No, these are two names for two persons. So, so distinction continues to be maintained, but something else happens by the word and here, right? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, who, who, who alone is able to grant grace and peace? Only God. That's, those are gifts of God. I mean, we, we would love to give grace and peace. Have you ever counseled anybody? You would love to give peace to them? Wouldn't you love to do that? But we can't do that. Only, only God can grant grace and peace. So grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ indicates complete equality, right? Equality. So, so indeed, the other pillar that has to be in place in order to understand the doctrine of the Trinity is the equality pillar. Equality, where Father and Son are equally God equal in their deity. And let, let me just press that one, one step further. There are different ways in which things can be equal. Um, for example, you and I are equal because we, we each have the same kind of nature. You have a human nature, I have a human nature, and hence we are equally human, right? So th this is what might be called an equality of same kind right? Uh, two dogs are equal. They have, the, they have a canine nature and so on. 
Uh, there's another, and, and of course, in one sense, this is true of the of the Trinitarian persons, they do have an equality of kind. Um, what, what kind of being is the Father? Divine. What kind of being is the Son? Divine. And so on. So it, they have that, but it's not the most important way in which they are equal. Here, here's another way in which things can be equal. Uh, a, an equality of proportionality. Uh, imagine a pie divided into three equal pieces where piece A, B, and C are equal size, so, they, so they're equal pieces because they're th of the same size. So they have an equality of proportionality, right? Well, there's a sense in which uh, the, the Trinitarian persons also have an equality of proportionality. What, what percentage of deity is the Father? One third? No, 100% God. What proportion of deity is the Son? 100%. What proportion of deity is the Spirit? 100%. So yes, they have that also, but there is yet another way in which things can be equal that in my mind is only true of the Trinitarian persons. At least I, if you can think of another example that I won't say that again, you know, but I, I think <clears throat> I haven't been able to think of another example of this kind of equality where it's an equality of identity an equality of identity where the Father and the Son and the Spirit are equal, not, not merely because they have the same kind of nature or the same proportion of deity, but, but rather that the Father possesses the identically same nature that the Son possesses. And the, and the Son possesses the identically same nature that the Spirit possesses. Why? Because there is one God. And that one God then has one nature that nature you might think of as the, as the, um, the, the collection of all of the attributes of God that are brought together, uh, the, the, the attribute of divine power, and divine wisdom, divine knowledge, and so on. All the attributes of God comprise the nature of God, and that nature is fully possessed by the Father, fully possessed by the Son, fully possessed by the Spirit. So indeed, three personal expressions of one undivided divine nature. And this is true eternally. So, so these two pillars uphold the doctrine of the Trinity, distinction and equality. An equality of identity, to be more precise, have to be in place. If you lose distinction, then you lose Trinitarian monotheism. You lose the, the, the threeness of, the, of, the, of our understanding of who God is. If you lose the, the oneness, the equality of identity, then you lose monotheism, right? And you end up with tritheism, polytheism, right? So here's Christianity that is neither polytheistic nor is it Unitarian. It's, it's Trinitarian monotheism because of the distinction of persons, but the unity of the one nature possessed fully, equally, eternally by the Father and the Son and the Spirit. So, uh, you know, the, the contours of the Trinity are expressed in the way Paul thinks of Father and Son together. You know, another interesting verse to, to think of in terms of these two pillars of distinction and equality, uh, John 1.1, 1, 1. think of it with me. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. Which pillar? Which theme? Distinction, right? The, the, the two of them are with each other. Uh, the word was with God. So the two are together, but they're distinct from each other. And then the last phrase, and the word was God. Equality. So indeed, you, ha you have right in the opening verse of John's gospel, uh, this understanding of the importance of distinction and equality for understanding the Trinity correctly. Okay, given that background to the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, let's take a look now at the Father, Son, and Spirit in verses 3 to 14. And we'll begin with the Father because that's where Paul begins and uh, great, lays great stress on the work of the Father. So look at verse 3 with me. <clears throat> Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now it strikes me that Paul could have made the basic point that he is making here in simpler terms. Uh, 
he could have said, and it would have been correct, he could have said, blessed be God for all the blessings God has designed to give to us. True enough, but not precise enough. True enough, but not precise enough. So instead of saying, blessed be God for all the blessings God brings to us, instead he says, blessed be God, the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, right? So here, what Paul is saying is that every blessing that we receive in this life and in the life to come, blessings that will never end. I mean, this just staggers our minds to realize there never will be a day when God says, you know what? The storehouse of blessings is empty. I've given them all out. There's nothing more to get from me. It'll never happen. So the, the blessings that the Father has designed for us that are for this life and the life to come, all of them are secured for us by the work of His Son. They're all in Christ. All those blessings designed by the Father are accomplished by the work of the Son. And in fact, so much of what follows in this text fits that pattern. It's from the Father through the Son. From the Father by the agency of the Son. But I think in, in uh, verse 3, the Spirit is also evident. It, in, the, in the phrase, at least in the English translation, uh, as spiritual blessings. Bl blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Which raises the question, what in the world does he mean by a spiritual blessing? Well, s some have thought, if you look at commentaries on this, some have thought that this is spiritual as opposed to physical. So as opposed to mere, mere physical things, food, drink, clothing, whatever, things in this world, uh, he has in mind those loftier, grander, glorious, spiritual, non-material, eternal kinds of things. That's possible, but I'm very doubtful that's what Paul has in mind. Uh, for, for one reason, he's not a Platonist. That sounds very Platonic to me. You know, the forms, the, the ethereal realm, that's, that's the real one. This material realm is, is simply what it is because it is a, 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 um, a, a mere image of that one, but it's not, it's not substantive in itself. And that, that's, that's Plato, but that's not, that's not the Bible. I mean, you, th you think, well, what's the first request that we're told to ask the Father for in the Lord's Prayer? After our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It's physical. I mean, so, so of course, the Father is the one. Every good and perfect gift is from above. James 1, 17, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So I, I, don't, think that, I don't think it is um, physical as opposed, as opposed to spiritual because God, God is the giver of every good gift we have, that, and that includes physical blessings. So I, I think more likely is that what, what he's saying is these are blessings that come to us only through the, the ministry of the Spirit as the Spirit brings those to us in our own experience, our own lives. So if that's the case, and what Paul is describing in verse 3 is that every blessing is designed by the Father, accomplished by the work of the Son, and mediated to us, brought to us experientially through the work of the Spirit. <clears throat> so indeed, we have in verse 3 then a, uh, a full-fledged Trinitarian statement of, uh, of the good gifts of God to us <clears throat> from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. But then as Paul continues, you see that he, he continues an emphasis on from the Father. So after verse 3, blessed be the God and Father, then verse 4, just as He chose us in Him. So, so just think about that for a moment. Just as He chose us in Him. By the way, if you ever want to really be, begin to see the Trinitarian specificity that is in the New Testament, you have to learn to pay attention to pronouns, divine pronouns, the he's, him's, his's that you find when it relates to a divine being in the New Testament, almost all divine pronouns, again, not every one, but almost all of the divine pronouns in the, in the New Testament are references to one or another person of the Trinity rather than a reference to the one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. 
A few of them are to the one God, but most of them are references to one or another Trinitarian person. So here in verse 4, <clears throat> just as he chose us in him, well, who's the he? Who's the he who chose us? Well, go back to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing and the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him. It's pretty clear, isn't it, from verse 3. This must be the Father's choosing in his Son, in Christ. So indeed, th though we talk about divine election, in fact, I've written a chapter of a book uh, on, on five views on divine election um, that's that's titled, you know, divine election, even though we talk about that, and it's not wrong, it's just not precise, because actually election is the work of the Father. The Father chooses the bride that His Son will have, chooses those who will comprise uh, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, th those who are saved. You know, all the Father gives to me, I will raise them up on the last day, Jesus says in John 6. So indeed, they're from the Father, they're the, they're the the chosen ones that the Father has chosen. So indeed, he, he, he again understands the Father then as the, the one who, who is responsible, responsible ultimately for deciding uh, who will be saved. And by the way, I just want you to think, I, I know that in this community there is a, a recognition of the importance of, of what are called the doctrines of grace that include a strong view of divine sovereignty in our salvation. But I, I just want you to, to, to think about this, that um, Paul, Paul is in the frame of mind of thinking all the ways that we have been blessed by God. You know, God the, God the Father has blessed us. And isn't it amazing that the first thing that comes to his mind and off his pen as he writes is, when he thinks of the concept, how have we been blessed by God, by God the Father? How have we been blessed? First thing, election. Now, I just think in many churches I'm familiar with, at least in the United States, I take it it probably would be the same here in Norway, that if you ask typical Christian people to, to you know, enumerate the blessings of God to them, election, the doctrine of election would not make the list and it certainly wouldn't head the list, right? First thing mentioned. In fact, the second one is, verse four, verse five, in love he predestined us. So election and predestination, which are not identical, but they're closely related concepts, you know, are, are what Paul thinks of, and you wonder why would he do that? Why, why would those ideas of election and predestination head the list for Paul for, for how we are blessed by the Father? And the answer is because he knows that none of the rest would happen if he hadn't chosen us to be his people. Having chosen us to be his people, we become then the recipients of all that he has designed for us in Christ. And so indeed, we have to be in, as it were, to get, to get that, to, to, to be recipients of it all. So indeed, election is at the top of the list. It's a glorious doctrine. It is an absolute tragedy that the doctrine of election has become, for so many Christian people, a divisive, derisive doctrine. You know, one that you shy away from, one, one that you're scared of. What, what in fact, it defines who we are. We are the chosen people. I, I read a, a, a Jewish, a novel uh, a number of years ago by a Jewish novelist by the name of Chaim Potok. Uh, the novel's entitled The Chosen. And as I read, it's about, about uh, a group of Hasidic Jews in New York City. <clears throat> and uh, very fascinating. I, I've read it uh, three times. It's a, a really interesting novel. In any case, it just struck me that the Jewish people have never had a problem with owning the concept of we are the chosen people. But the church has. Why? Why? Uh, if, I mean, ought we not from, from the New Testament understand we are a chosen race, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we, we, we are the chosen people of God. So indeed, instead of seeing that as divisive, think of it the way Paul does. I mean, if we think of it as, as a troubling doctrine, a scary doctrine, uh, a, a divisive doctrine, and Paul thinks of it as glorious, one of us is thinking about it wrongly. I wonder who that is. Yeah. So we, we need to rethink this, don't we? To, to see the beauty, the glory, to be humbled. Do you know what, what the doctrine of election ought to do? Is humble us. Because we have nothing to do. We are as unworthy, as undeserving as anyone else. 
that he would choose us to be his people is grace upon grace upon grace, unmerited kindness, mercy from God, showered upon people who deserve none of what he has given to them. So it, it ought to be very humbling. So the Father, l- let, me, let me move ahead here. The Father is the one who really is the grand architect of our salvation, the designer <coughs> of it, who chooses, who, who in love predestines us to adoption and so on. Let, let me show you one more verse on the Father. It's verse nine, just because of how powerful it is <coughs> in terms of the work of the Father in in accomplishing everything that he wants to see done. So verse nine, at least in my translation, the the sentence begins at the end of verse eight. In all wisdom and insight, notice the pronouns, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. A lot of he's and him's and his's, right? So question, Who do the pronouns refer to? Well, in all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed, here's the clue, in him. What does the in him likely refer to? It's in Christ, right? Go back to verse 4. We're chosen in Christ. Verse 3, in him, uh, all all, all the... the, uh, Um, spiritual blessings have been granted to us in Christ. So indeed, the end of verse 9 is their purpose in Christ. So indeed, the the other he's then in this verse are the Father. So let me read it to you, inserting Father in that. He, the Father, made known to us the mystery of his, the Father's will, according to the Father's kind intention, which the Father purposed in him, the Son, with a view to the administration of, that to administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ. So the Father has designed that in the end, everything will be summed up in Christ. I mean, we see that in Philippians 2, where every knee bows, every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. We see it in 1 Corinthians 15, where all things are put in subjection to Christ. And then when all things are put in subjection to Christ, then Christ himself will put himself into subjection to the one who subjected all things to him, that God the Father may be all in all. So again, you see the same thing there. So indeed, this was the Father who has designed everything that takes place in the universe. Ultimately, to redound to the glory of his son, who indeed then redounds to the glory of the father. So the father, the grand architect of the salvation that we have. What about the son? Well, the son and and his work in terms of our salvation is is focused upon in verse seven. In verse seven of Ephesians one, we read this, that in him, that is in Christ, We know that because of the end of verse six refers to his beloved, and that's his beloved son. So verse seven begins then, in him, that is the son, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. So here Paul focuses upon our our redemption through the work of Christ. Uh, Why focus on redemption? And I think it's because what Paul wants us to see <clears throat> is that by redeeming us, two things happen. What, one is that we belong to him then. We belong to Christ. He purchases us. This is the la- language, the New Testament language for purchasing. The, the term agorazo, to purchase in the agora, the marketplace. So th- those terms refer to the, the, the purchasing of something that was bound to another. And of course, we're bound to sin and bound to Satan. And he purchases us so that we now are bound to Christ. Um, you know, by the way, I think it's helpful when you, you share the gospel with people to help them understand what it means to become a Christian is you come to the one, Christ, who redeemed you. And the reason that's helpful is because if you explain what that is, that he redeemed you through his blood on the cross, if you explain what that is, then they know from the very, the very beginning of, of their new life in Christ that they're owned by Christ. He has bought them. He, they, they belong to him. So there's no split between coming to Christ as Savior and then later coming to Christ as Lord, you know, or something like that. You know, there, there's, no, there's no confusion about who it is whose we are. 
We, we are His because He bought us uh, by, by His work on the cross. But the other thing that happened by His work on the cross is His purchase price not only bought us, but it paid the penalty for our sin. So, so that we no longer stand guilty before God. This is glorious news. So no, notice how he links together forgiveness of sins with redemption, right? In him we have, been, uh, we, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. And so the, this uh, you know, glorious teaching of the New Testament that Christ is the one who alone has secured our complete pardon from sin, complete acquittal, a complete forgiveness. So there is no condemnation. We, we no longer stand before God deserving what we used to deserve. And that is everlasting punishment, everlasting condemnation, which, we, we, which everyone will receive apart from the grace of God in Christ and having their sins forgiven. <clears throat> and you know, you might, you might wonder, now why... Why was this necessary if, in fact, we had a sacrificial system in the Old Testament that, that took away sins uh, through, through, through the sacrifice of animals? Why wouldn't that be adequate just to have that? Well, we know from the book of Hebrews, don't we, that <clears throat> those sacrifices that were given had to be repeated over and over and over again because sins continue, right? And, and they never could end, uh, never, never could take away all sin, by that. Only Christ could do that. But it's actually worse than that. It's actually worse than thinking <clears throat> that those sacrifices in the Old Testament only took away some sin. Actually, Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. I'll add the phrase, at all. They, they do nothing to take away sin. So what was the point of those Old Testament sacrifices that were required of people when, when God would forgive them on the basis of those sacrifices? If they didn't actually take away sin at all, uh, th then what was the point of them? And the answer is, they represented pictorially a sacrifice that would come later. They were legally tied to that so that they were efficacious, not in themselves. That They had their desired effect. That's what the word efficacious means. They had their desired effect in bringing about uh, forgiveness of sin, not because of what they were in themselves, but because of what they pointed to in the future, and that was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. You see it? So it, it is something like... Those sacrifices in the Old Testament were something like uh, when you go to the store and you purchase something, you have to put that in scare quotes, purchase something with a credit card. How much do you actually pay for that shirt that you've purchased uh, at, at, a, at a clothing store? How much did you actually pay for it at, at the point that you give them the credit card? And the answer is you paid nothing right? So how is it you can walk out of the store with that shirt in your bag, smile at the guard who is at the door, and he doesn't arrest you for stealing? <clears throat> how, can, how can that happen? And the answer is because you've signed a slip that obligates you to a future payment. There's a legal connection between that credit card signature and your obligatory, your, uh, your obligation <clears throat> to pay for it later. <clears throat> if you don't pay for it later, you have stolen it, right? So when you think about it, every time sin occurred in the Old Testament and, and a sacrifice, uh, an animal sacrifice was offered, think of it, somebody signed a credit card slip, as it were, obligating themselves to a future payment. Who was that person who signed it every time? I would argue it's the Father. The Father signs it saying, I will pay this through the death of my Son. And because of the certainty of that coming sacrifice of my Son and the infinite fullness of that sacrifice, I can forgive your sin now because of what has happened. Well, from our perspective, we look back on it. We see now a sacrifice that has been done. So there is more, no more need for the sacrifice of animals there, or any other sacrifice because that one sacrifice, that one redeeming work paid the penalty for all of our sin. So indeed, the glorious accomplishment 
of salvation is through the Son's work on the cross where he brought about redemption, which is the forgiveness of our sins. And then the final work, uh, Trinitarian work, is of the Spirit. And this Paul refers to in verses 13 and 14. Look with me again at these verses. In him, that is in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him, in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So verses 13 and 14 announce two different ways in which the Holy Spirit uh, brings to us salvation, experientially, really in time and place in history. He brings about our salvation uh, first of all, by being the one who seals us into Christ. So we see we are sealed in him, in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. <clears throat> There's a similar statement in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 that, that says that we are baptized into Christ by the Spirit. So the Spirit baptizes us, seals us. It has really has the same idea that we are placed into Christ, it, which means that, that Christ's life and death, think of Romans 6. Do you not know that you have died? When, you, when Christ died, you died with him. When he was raised, you were raised to newness of life. So we are, we are united with the one who has died and been raised for our sin. So his life is our life. We have, we have our new life in Christ. I mean, Paul, Paul thinks of this in such radical ways that he could say what he does in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Yeah, I mean, you hear those words and go, but you're writing this. Obviously, you're living. And the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So in other words, I'm not my own any longer. I'm not who I was. I am a new creature, a new creation in Christ be because, of my, be because of my identity with him. His death is my death. His resurrection is my resurrection. And indeed, uh, the, the life that I live now is His. And what guarantees that cannot change is the Spirit. The Spirit seals us in Christ. And there's no one who can overpower the omnipotent Holy Spirit. Remember, He has all the attributes of deity, including omnipotence. So no one can... can can take one who is sealed in Christ and remove him or her from Christ. So we are his forever. This you know, is a very strong verse to support what is sometimes called the doctrine of eternal security. The security of a believer in knowing that once he or she has truly been saved can never lose or forfeit that salvation. So indeed, this is true. So indeed, the sealing... <clears throat> into Christ by the Spirit. But then also in verse 14, the Spirit is given to us as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. So not only does the Spirit seal us into Christ, but we, in a sense, are sealed with the Spirit or the, the, the Spirit is granted to us. He indwells us. In part, the emphasis here in this verse is as the Father's guarantee to us that we are His forever. It's His pledge to us, His token of promise to us. The closest analogy we have in our <clears throat> cultures today is, is the, the giving of an engagement ring from, from a man to a woman when he proposes marriage to her. And she puts on that engagement ring and it indicates His promise to her, right? Well, of course, we humans are fallible uh, and, and, uh, and sinful people, and we can break our promises. So that happens sometimes with engagements that are made here. But this is from God, who is, who is always faithful to keep His word, never, ever <clears throat> goes back on a promise, right? And He says, this token I give you of the Spirit is my guarantee that you will receive the inheritance, 
By the way, Paul refers to this inheritance three times in Ephesians chapter one. It means a lot to him. And really what it amounts to is all the blessings that have been brought to us in Christ. It's the whole package of, of who, who we are in Christ and what we will receive forever and ever. That inheritance in Christ is, is guaranteed to us. So again, verse 14 is another strong uh, support for the doctrine of eternal security. Not only are we sealed in Christ, but we've been granted the Spirit as a token, a pledge that we will receive the inheritance the Father has pledged that is ours. So the, the work of the Spirit then, uh, of course there is more to the work of the Spirit than in these two verses. But what Paul focuses on here are those two ideas in, in which we are in Christ and the Spirit is in us. Uh, and, and we are the, the possession of the Father forever and ever. So as we bring this to conclusion, the grand architect of salvation is the Father, the glorious accomplishment of salvation through the Son and the, glor and the gracious application of salvation through the Spirit. Just consider with me three points <clears throat> of application. First, marvel at the beauty of the triune God and the salvation that he has accomplished. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't salvation have such a richer texture and beauty, and, and um, um, delicacy. Uh, when, when you see the particular aspect of the Father's work, the particular aspect of the Son's work, the particular aspect of the Spirit's work, and realize these are never works that are at odds with each other. They're never in conflict with each other. <clears throat> They're never done independent of the others. But what they do do is, is work together in a beautiful um, combination to bring about the fullness of our saving work. In fact, and, and you know, I, I would make this point, I don't know if I have time to develop it right now, but it is not only the case that, that our salvation comes from the Father and the Son and the Spirit, I think it can be demonstrated that the only salvation we could receive, period, is from the one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. So God must be the triune God to be Savior. I'll, I'll give you a hint of this. Because in order to be Savior, God on the one hand has to judge our sin, but it can't be our sin in us. He has to judge our sin in a substitute who must be His Son. So it has to be a Father and a Son judging sin, bearing sin simultaneously. So you've got to have Father and Son, but you have to have Son who gets to the cross as a man because a man has to bear sin. A man has to die uh, the, the death that is deserved. Uh, a, a man has to take our place and suffer the consequences we deserved. Well, how do you get a man from zero to 33 years old sinless uh, to the cross as a sinless substitute? And the answer is by the Spirit. Uh, more on that in the retreat this weekend. So indeed, <clears throat> it requires Father, Son, and Spirit to bring about our salvation as each contributes what they do to the one work of God. Secondly, um, this just amplifies the first point, but consider the work of the Trinitarian persons as one of rich harmony, not simple unison. One in which there is a unity of work without sameness and a diversity of roles without discord. So when you think about it, how, how, what, what is it that has a, a unity that is not, I'll, I'll, put it, I'll use a musical word here, a unity that is not unison. A unity that is not unison. You know what unison is? Where you all sing the same line of notes. The melody line, usually, is what you would sing. It'd be odd if it were anything else. Uh, you sing the melody line, right? Uh, so that's unison. So here, that, of course, there, that's a unity that is unison. But how do you have a unity that is not unison, and at the same time you have a distinction that is not discord? What's discord? Imagine three three-year-olds sitting on that chair playing the piano. That's discord. Okay, so how do you have unity that is not unison with distinction that is not discord? Answer, harmony. Harmony. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor for the Trinity? So you have the three singing their own lines of notes, like a trio, right? 
I, I would argue in that metaphor, just to develop it uh, a bit more, that uh, the composer of the, uh, of, the, of the entire composition is the father. He, he's the one who assigns the, the lines of notes. And, and notice the father gives to his son the melody line, the lead line, right, is given to the son. The father's own line is a supporting line, really, supporting the son in what he does. The spirit's, likewise, line is a supporting line. So these, these lines of harmony enrich, enhance the beauty of the whole in a way that is textured and glorious, that is so much richer than mere unison could ever be. And so indeed, I think that, that metaphor of harmony is such a beautiful one that depicts the Trinitarian work. And when you think of it, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting this only to talk about the Trinity, but just think, God, God intends for his Trinitarian life to be modeled in the way we live our lives. So when, when you think of what harmony would look like in a home, I mean, it's just, just take, take that home with you. Think about it. What would harmony look like in a home? Well, it's, it's where there would be a composition, as it were. There would be, there, someone has, has orchestrated, has, has designed what, what the, the music that this family is going to sing. But it acknowledges the differences among the, 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 the persons within that family, their interests and their, their temperaments and their, their personalities, right? So all of that is factored in. And so there are lines sung that fit who they are but they're sung in ways that complement others as they sing their part of the music, right? So it's always complementing, not, not conflicting, um, enhancing, not destroying. You see how that, so, so that harmony, I think is just a rich metaphor. And when you look at the Trinity, you see how that works and how that ought to be modeled in our homes, how that ought to be modeled in our church home, church family right? Where you have different gifts uh, in, in the body of Christ. The Spirit gives gifts to each one of us as He alone wills, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, and yet those gifts are given for the common good, right? They're not, they're not given for one to boast in, oh, look at the gift I have, you know? No, nor are they given for, for faction purposes, to divide people into factions. Those gifts are given to unify us in Christ. And so there is a unity, a wholeness, a, a, a beauty of, of growth in, in the character of Christ that marks the use of all of the gifts, and yet a recognition of the diversity, where each, each person rightly contributes different things, and we all need each other, right? We're all givers and receivers. There's, there's, there's not some in the church that are the givers, and the rest of us are receivers, and there, there are not some in the church who are the receivers, and they don't give anything. No, we're all givers and receivers as we share in the body of Christ with the gifts that we have. So I think another beautiful a place where you see that concept of harmony where it ought to be lived out is in a church uh, family uh, as we gather together. Okay, third and last application. <clears throat> Understand the intrinsic authority, submission, structure within the relations of the very Trinitarian persons themselves and embrace the relevance to human life made in God's image. Authority and submission in relationships of husbands and wives and in church leaders and church members. So it is amazing, isn't it, that you have in the Trinity three persons who always are who they are. Father is not ad hoc. It's not open to change. They don't swap roles. Oh, you be father for two, two millennia and, uh, and I'll be son and then we'll switch. No, father is eternal father. Son is eternal son. And, and, and what that means is Father always acts then in a way that befits who He is as Father. Son as eternal Son always acts in a way that befits who He is as Son. And you ask, well, what, what does that look like? Well, look at the Bible. Look, look, at what, look at what we're told about Father-Son relationships. And clearly, the Father is the one who sends, the Son goes. The Father is the one who commands, the Son obeys. The Father is the one who wills, the Son carries out the will of the Father. And so you, and you never find the opposite of that. You never find the son commanding and the father obeying. You never find the son sending and the father going, right? It's always one way. And so you ask, well, what does that father-son relationship look like? Well, it looks like it, one, one in which the father has ultimate authority and the son carries out the will of the father. Well, guess what God does when he creates us? You know, isn't it interesting the, 
the, the language of Genesis 1, 26 changes from earlier in Genesis 1. Earlier it was, then God said, let there be, let there be light, let there be, so on. Verse 26, then God said, let us, plural, let us make man singular in our image according to our likeness and let them, plural, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and so on. So, so you realize that the, the singular plural of God and of humans is, is built into the creation account <clears throat> where God is communicating to us there is an image bearing that takes place in how you, male and female, uh, relate to one another. So he builds into that relationship equality of nature, exhibiting the equality of nature uh, of the Trinity. So equally human, equally image of God, equal dignity, uh, worthy of equal respect, male and female, in nature, completely equal. And it's so important for, for men to get this about their wives that Paul, Peter, I'm sorry, Peter will say in 1 Timothy 3, 7, that they are to live with their wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel. So indeed, there's a distinction. He has authority, don't abuse it. So live with her in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life or your prayers will not be heard. That's how much God disdains, uh, disapproves of men who do not think of, act toward, talk about, have attitudes toward their wives as fully equals with them. That's what God thinks about that. He won't hear your prayers. So full equality in their natures, but distinctions in roles where he puts Adam as head over Eve. He's created first. She, she comes from him. I mean, all those things we know from the New Testament are indicators of God's designing into the created order authority of the male and submission of the female. And you think, well, is that good to build authority and submission? Well, it certainly is if it reflects God. Do you get the point of this? If it reflects God, authority and submission in the Trinity. Father, always Father. Father. Always highest in authority. Son, always doing the will of the Father. That's reflected in how he makes us. So marvel at the, the glory of the Trinity reflected in how we are to relate, including relations of authority and submission in the church and in the home where God wants those to be lived out. All right, well, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege we've had to think about uh, glorious truths this evening uh, of who you are as the one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. May we know you better. May we pay attention, Lord, to your self-revelation in Scripture and know you as you've revealed yourself to us. And may we honor you and live lives that reflect more of the image you've made us to be. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.